Good morning. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started because we got three great speakers for you. We don't want to run out of time. We're going to go to 9 o'clock. Appreciate you getting here a little bit early today, so we do have that extra time. I'm Kelly McCutcheon, President of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. I'd like to wish everyone a happy 2012. We had a great uh, end of the year last year at the Foundation. We had our most successful legislative policy briefing that we've ever had in September and the most successful annual dinner we've ever had, of celebrating our 20th anniversary and honoring our chairman, Rogers Wade. And uh, we are very excited about 2012. Uh, our next event is going to be February 22nd. You'll notice a, a theme of education. I think it's a great year of opportunity in education reform. We're going to have one of the founders of PayPal, who is really focused on education and technology. The title of his speech is going to be Education, Entrepreneurship, and How Technology is Transforming the World by Transforming Both. His name is Dr. Rod Martin. There's a handout at your table. You can read all about his bio. I think that's going to be a breakfast you will not want to miss. <coughs> at your seats, we put a couple of uh, gifts. First of all, it's American Legislative Exchange Annual Report Card on Education. Hot off the presses, arrived in our offices last night. Uh, you're one of the first ones to see it. Uh, even the Heritage Foundation is having an event focused on rolling this out. They're not having it until Thursday. Uh, so you've got this fascinating material. Yeah, I would urge you to take a look. look. Look at North Carolina and Georgia. A very similar demographics, similar population. Look at what they're spending and what their performance has been. It shows you the opportunity Georgia has. And, you know, what, what we ought to be doing versus what we are doing. Uh, we also have in front of you a DVD. And we want to thank Americans for Prosperity. I think Joel Foster and uh, Virginia Galloway uh, are here, and, and we really appreciate you making this available to us. It is called uh, Making the Grade in Georgia. Uh, it is a great little documentary about school choice of all kinds, and uh, it will be showing today. This is the first Yesterday was the first day of National School Choice Week, and uh, many of us are going down to the Capitol for a rally at 10 o'clock, and uh, Virginia and Joel are going to be showing this film in the Sloppy Floyd building several times today at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 5 o'clock. So if you're down at the Capitol and you want to see the film, you know, go over there, tell your friends about it, and of course we've got a copy for you to take home. Now, you know, you've heard the saying, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, I think this has a retail value of about $15. The DVD is certainly worth $10, so you got a free breakfast. <laughs> uh, I know many of you, and hopefully all of you, subscribe to our Friday Facts. We get several you know, thousand people get that every Friday. It's our way once a week to communicate with you what's going on in the Foundation, what tidbits that uh, people find interesting to know. Neil Bortz likes to read from it each Friday. But another good way to stay in touch with us is social media. We have about 1,500 fans on our Facebook page, and we have our 500 followers at our, at our Twitter feed, uh, at GPPF, so I'd encourage you to sign up for those. Great way then, not only for you to know what's going on with the Foundation, but also to share that with your friends, and hopefully you know, educate more people around our state. I'm really excited about the program today, because, you know, I can get excited about tax reform, and we, and we need to do something on that issue, but nothing's more important than education. And really, from an economic development perspective, that is critically important. And during this election year, there's a lot of talk about income inequality. You know, the 1% the versus others, and you know, there's a lot, a lot of difference of opinion, but one thing that I think we all agree on, liberals, conservatives alike, is in America, everyone ought to have equal opportunity. And that's what we're talking about today, is breaking down the barriers for equal opportunity to get a good education. Because particularly now, more than ever before, if you don't have a good education, you really are setting yourself for a life, up for a lifetime of struggle. And if that, if that gets down, it's not a state issue or a local issue, it's, really, it's a child and a, and a human issue. And we can't forget that. That's how important these decisions are. And we've got three great speakers here to talk about three very different areas of where Georgia this year can make a significant difference in opening up that opportunity 
for children. I'm going to introduce each one uh, before they come up. And uh, they're going to talk for about 10 minutes each. And then we're going to bring them back up to the table and hopefully have uh, 20, 30 minutes for questions and answers. I think you'll have a lot of questions for them. Our first speaker is Dean Alford. And uh, Dean uh, has been all around education. He was a state legislator for five terms. Of course, they spent a lot of time talking about education. He has been uh, on the Technical College System of Georgia board. He has served on the Georgia School Board, the state of Georgia, and he also just recently has been named to the Board of Regents. Now, despite his, his local inexperience in pre-K, uh, I don't know anybody else that has had that kind of experience in education. Uh, he, he is a, a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he, he started many companies. Right now he is a CEO of Allied Energy Services. Uh, he headed up Governor Purdue's Education Finance Task Force and uh, just an incredible leader in his community and uh, philanthropically and otherwise and we're very happy to hear him uh, today talk about Move On When Ready. Dean? Thank you Kelly good morning. I'm going to take off my watch because Kelly said I had 10 minutes of course I am the son of a Southern Baptist preacher and that never meant a thing to him when he took off his watch so uh, I'm going to try to stay within that time frame. One of the things this morning I've had the unique privilege over the past uh, year and a half to work with an organization called Complete College America. It's an organization funded by the Bill Gates Foundation and working with Complete College America about 27 states have really made the decision that completing basically post-secondary is a very important factor. And they have done some analysis that I think is very appropriate for us to listen to this morning about our state that sets up a little bit of what I want to talk to you about. According to Complete College of America, 100 ninth graders enter the ninth grade. 54 graduate. 27 go to our university system. 14 come back their sophomore year, and 6 graduate. Okay, let me get that to you again. 27, 54 graduate from high school, 27 go into to the university system, 14 go come back for their sophomore year, and 6 graduate. 13 go to the technical college system, or two-year schools, 7 come back for the second year, and 3 graduate. Now, let me give you some amazing facts. Those students who entered in their freshman year, whether it would be in our technical college system or university system, that did not come back for their second year cost the state last year $254 million. And what it tells us, of course, is that when we analyze why that is the case, it appears in large part because what the completion is not happening is because too many of them are coming and they're not prepared. And what I mean by that is if you basically look at those, about a third of the incoming freshmen in our university system had to take remedial classes. About 42% of the technical college system had to take remedial classes. A student who takes three remedial classes has a 3% graduation rate in our post-secondary system. Now, I say all that to say this, is that one of the issues that's facing us, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some things, is the fact is I think we have to look at the educational enterprise. And one of the things we struggle with in Georgia is that we don't always look at it as entire as an enterprise. Um, as Kelly said, I've had a really unique pleasure of serving the state school board, the Tuttle College system, and now the Board of Regents. And while there's a genuine, genuine desire to work together, the reality of it is those silos are just natural as they can be. And the because of that is that we sometimes don't understand what we need to do to move people through that process and through that system. And so one of the things we've been really trying to think about and work about as a group of uh, concerned citizens is about the idea of recognizing we need to move children, have them prepared, have them ready, so that when they get to college or career, they are basically ready to get there. And one of the things we've been talking about, proposing, and I know the uh, superintendent now talks about, 
is that we must do some kind of an assessment to know really where they are. Because here's the reality. We have too many children who are coming out of K-12 who think they're ready, and to their great surprise, when they enter the university system, as an example, or the technical college system, and they take the compass test, and they're told now you've got to take two remedial classes. They're in shock. Their parents are in shock. And they spend a year in our system and no college credit. No wonder they don't ever complete it. And so one of the things that we really feel strongly about is whatever the assessment the technical college and the university system is going to use to determine readiness, that, that mechanism should be used as early as the 10th grade so that students and parents know where their children are. So they can begin to talk about where do we go from here. In other words, this. If a student is ready in the, in the 10th grade to begin to do post-secondary, let's let them. Let's, let's, let's engage them either in classes in the university system or technical college, and there's an array of things out there, an array of doing that, but we must begin to do that. But on the other hand, if they're not, remediation should be the responsibility of K-12. They need to know where they are. The problem is once they graduate, they don't know where they I mean, It's too late to send them back. I've had very few high schools who said, you know, we'll take them back, retrain them, and send them to you. That's not going to happen. <laughs> By the way, the technical college system does have that policy. If you hire one of its graduates and it's not prepared, they will retrain them at no cost. That's a guarantee. And so one of the things I think we really have to begin to look at is this concept of the education enterprise and how we assess so that people know. And we have different tools. I mean, I was, uh, this past weekend, I was uh, with a gentleman with, uh, talking about assessment. And the AP exam is a really great example of that in our system. Um, I'll tell you a story about my two children. I had a son who's getting his master's degree as we speak at George Tech. And he took AP stat, statistics, in high school. He made a five on the exit exam, but he made a C in the class. I had a daughter, I won't tell her I told y'all the story. <laughs> I had a daughter who took AP in history. She made a three on the X exam, but made an A in the class. Now, which of those am I to believe? Which am I those to believe? And the point is, grades mean nothing for the most part at the end of the day. We don't know where our kids are. And so this concept of move on when ready means we should be assessing every child about where they are and move them at a rate that allows them to move quickly. Because we do know this, those students who take post-secondary classes while they are in high school, don't do remediation, have a higher graduation rate, and it saves us a lot of money. And so there has to be truly this blending of tearing down those walls that we have built up for whatever reasons. Now, I don't know the complete answer to this, but I will tell you an, uh, an, an assessment that I've made of our systems a little bit. And it really is one day I was sitting and I was thinking about, we have three unique systems. And when you analyze the cost per results and the cost per student hour or whatever, you come up with some very interesting thing is who's very efficient and who's very not and not. And I'll give you this to be the fact. Here's what's unique. Our K-12 system, our K-12 system has assigned areas, but no choice. Our university system has no assigned areas, so they can go wherever they want to go. I think we're about to try to pull some of that back in, but students have choice. The technical college systems have assigned areas and choice. Now, I'll let you guess which one, on a per dollar basis, is the most, e the most economical and the most, in many ways, effective relative to those dollars. And the reason why, it is about systematic approaches the way you do education relative to that. And, and so what we, when you really look at those whole situations, you recognize that systematically we've got to change the enterprise. We have to look at the enterprise as a whole if we're really going to make significant changes. 
And I will tell you a couple of stats of, of late that really concern me. We had over 70 high schools in this state last year that over 50% of the ninth graders did not come back to temporary. Okay. We have some amazing stuff that we really have to get our hands around. And that only occurs when we really recognize every individual child is important. We should know where they are. And guess who else has a right that should know where they are? The student and the parents. And when we've been talking about move on when ready version 2, it is fundamentally based on that premise that people need to know where their children really are. I know there's a lot about concern about testing and I think that has to be evaluated, but at the end of the day is what is the common assessment through the enterprise? And that common assessment then allows us all to know and then allows students to basically, if they have to, remediate, but remediate in K-12, but that remediation, by the way, should not be based on CPAP. So the last thing I'll tell you about Move On One Radio, in our opinion, is that it should be based on competency, not based on how much time you set in your seat. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If you have a child, any children, and in particular if you've got grandchildren, today they all play games, video games. And what they know in those video games is at what level they are. They know that. And guess what? They can't go to the next level until they comprehend and they are competent at the level that they are. Now that is not based on how long they sit and play the game. It is based on whether or not they conquered the level they were at. <laughs> And the point is, that is in fact, to me, the transformation that is the opportunity when we talk about remediation, when we talk about move on ready, is that we give children the opportunity to move based on their ability to become competent in subject areas that really know they're ready to move on. Now, in my opinion, those are realities that can happen. Right now there's a, a task force within the university system and technical college to look at remediation and do it away with seat time and to allow students to basically remediate at a pace that allows them based on competency, not on course completion. If we're able to show that success, I hope that's something we move through the educational system is there. One last thing I will share with you. We have about 30,000 people, no, excuse me, about 30% of our population, adult population. Let me back up and give you another staff for that. We have 9 million Georgians. We have 1.8 million Georgians that do not have a high school or GED education. Some of our counties have over 35% of their adult population that are in that row. Guess what? Those communities aren't going to have economic development. <coughs> Now, that being said, only about 30% of our population has some kind of post-secondary education slash certification. And the reality of it is, and the governor has made it very clear with Complete College Georgia, is that number needs to go closer to 60%. I will submit to you, the way we do it today, we will not get there. It will take serious change in the way we go about education. But I will say this, if we don't get there, we will not be a player in the world of time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean. One thing that Dean talks about that I've heard him say I want to reiterate is you know, Move On Ready 1.0 would allow a kid to go ahead and graduate from high school and physically enroll in a college or university. And, and Dean talks about you know, how reality is uh, high school quarterbacks don't get really good until their junior or senior year. And now we have the opportunity, our technical colleges, they have online classes. We have over 100,000 kids enrolled in online classes. Our first two years of our curriculum at the Board of Regents is online. So they don't have to leave high school. They can participate in those extracurricular sports and, and still move on. And uh, the mastery-based or competency-based learning is what it's all about which gets us to our next speaker, Lisa Gillis. Uh, if you were at our first legislative policy briefing, you heard Governor Wise uh, talk about digital learning. Uh, former governor of West Virginia who's partnered with Governor Jeb Bush 
and uh, our own uh, Chip Rogers, who's on the Digital Learning Council. Uh, Lisa was the project lead for the Digital Learning Council and been all over this for many, many years, and I've been following her work. And I think it was about two years ago, we were at a conference maybe in Seattle or somewhere, and she told me she was moving to Atlanta. So I was thrilled that we'd have a, such a leader like that for digital learning here in our own state. She's made the, the comment that she is committed to the advancement of online and blended programs and educational environments where students will no longer be wedged into a one-size-fits-all system or forced to attend school where they live. I think that really says it all. And I think, Dean, you're absolutely right. Georgia, we have a diverse school system, kids in rural Georgia and inner city that can benefit from these things, but we also can be a provider. We're one of the leaders in the video game industry in Atlanta. We've got a huge economic opportunity to be at the forefront of this, and Lisa's going to tell us a little about how we can get there. Lisa Gills. much and it is a privilege and a pleasure to be here this morning and um, Kelly I have loved working with you as well because you are truly a national leader um, in, in pub public policy so um, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, a couple of thoughts on uh, dovetailing off of your comments as well as the Digital Learning Council and some recommendations for policy changes within the state to give you an overview, um, I am president and CEO of a, a nonprofit called Integrated Educational Strategies, and we work on a national level, currently working with multiple different states in doing three items, policy and advocacy review and redesign, instructional redesign with an emphasis in blended and digital learning, and then parent advocacy and support strategies. This has given us a, a viewpoint that is really amazing because as we get into these different states and we work with their departments of ed and we work with the different school districts, we see similarities and we th see things that are, that are different. And so we brought that back and I've taken that knowledge today and thought, okay, how can we look at what California is doing, Arizona is doing, New Mexico, uh, all these other states and apply them to ways that we can grow here in, um, in Georgia. So in Georgia alone, uh, there are 1,522,611 students enrolled in grades K to 12. The Fordham Institute just did a study. They said if you, um, and I've got all of that information here, so I brought extra copies. If you'd like to have this afterwards, please come see me. Um, but if you implement a digital or blended learning program, the cost savings can be up to 15% because of savings due to technology. So in Georgia, the uh, average per pupil expenditure is $8,595 per student. So with the uh, estimated that with the proper implementation of blended learning, the cost savings can amount to $1,289 per student or $1.98 billion annually in the state. Last year, as you know, as you mentioned, we do have a dropout epidemic in the United States. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone in this room is aware, but our, uh, our national average for graduation is between 65 and 67 percent. That means over 30 percent of our kids in our nation's schools that go into high school do not graduate. And if you extrapolate that out to the economic impact <coughs> on our nation and our individual states, it, it, is, it is considered a crisis. Today alone, while we are in our jobs and doing what we're doing, 6,000 kids will drop out of school across the United States. 6,000. And then you have to ask yourself, why is that? What's happening? Their study came out and said that 88% of those kids were actually academically succeeding at the time that they dropped out. So our first reaction is, oh, well, they were failing. Actually, they were bored. Now, bored and disengaged was the number one reason for dropout. Second the reason was life got in the way. So I had to go to work, or I got pregnant, or whatever the issues are of kids in high school. We have an ability to solve the first issue, the disengagement. We, as we look around at our kids, we're seeing that they are engaged in a digital world on a daily basis. This weekend, I had the privilege of actually going to a restaurant and watching the playoff games. It was so fun with a whole group of people that were cheering. It was really great, but what caught my attention was this particular restaurant, when I was a kid, you'd go in and they'd give you crayons and a piece of paper. They gave these kids iPads. And so the kids were sitting at the tables with the iPads, and I, I looked over at the table next to me, and there was a four-year-old on the iPad, and said, Mommy, Mommy, look at this. And the mom was going, show me about that. Tell me about that. And I thought, this is their world. And yet, this is their, this is their native language, 
And in most of our schools, we ask them to stop speaking their native language the minute they get into the classroom door. <laughs> so how does that make sense? Kids are walking around with mobile technology in their pockets. Every single student at the high school level has a cell phone, probably. A lot of them are smart smartphones. So what, why are we telling kids that they can't use that? Why are we prohibiting kids from social media in the classroom? And allowing some of, because we're, we're concerned. We're concerned about... Um, we're concerned about privacy, we're concerned about security. Those are great areas to be concerned in. But 95% of our kids would probably be responsible, so why are we prohibiting them from using it to save the 5% that aren't? Mm -hmm. So that's where smart policy and redesign comes in. Last year in Georgia, 44,884 students dropped out of high school. It's estimated that in Georgia, if Georgia graduated just 1,000 more of these 44,884 students, combined, the new graduates would likely, one, earn $11 million in additional earnings in an average year. So that's an average income of $11,000 per graduate. Spend an additional $1.1 million each year purchasing vehicles, and by the time they reach the midpoint of the careers, would buy homes worth $24 million more than they would have if they'd spent life without a diploma. And lastly, they would support 120 new jobs in the state, increase the gross state product by $16 million, and pour an additional $800,000 annually into the state coffers, all for their increased spending and investments. That's just if 1,000 kids could graduate. So when we're looking at all of this, we're looking at what is the solution. It seems obvious that the solution is digital learning. Is it a solution of blended and learning and integrating that into our classroom? So as Kelly mentioned, in 2010, Governor Wise and Governor Bush put together an initial initiative called the Digital Learning Council. I had the privilege of directing that uh, initiative, and we had 100, group, 100 people from uh, leaders in education, government, philanthropy, business, technology, and members of policy think tanks. They all came together. It was an intensive process. We met over 72 times, and the end result was a, a report called Digital Learning Now that was released in December of 2010 in Washington, D.C. So your own Senator Chip Rogers was actually a leader in that, so I just want to give a shout out to you. Um, for he attended every meeting he contributed and I, I, could, I knew I could always depend upon him to, to bring valuable information so thank you again for all of your participation and hard work on, on that. <laughs> what the um, designed was the 10 elements of digital learning and is organized in three general areas customization and success for all students a robust offering of high school high quality options and infrastructure it was amazing the type of perspectives that were brought into these discussions and how we together were crafting what the policy was moving forward. So they've taken it to the next level. Now that we've got the report, there's an initiative called the Digital Learning Now Initiative. This is a national campaign to integrate current and future technological innovations in public education to better prepare students with knowledge and skills that they need to succeed. From that initiative, we've now got something called the Roadmap to Reform. The Roadmap to Reform provides governors, lawmakers, and policymakers with tangible steps to transforming education into a model for a world, a system where every student graduates from high school with the skills and knowledge to succeed in college and career. These are all facts and figures that can be found at the Alliance for Excellent Education and the Foundation for Excellence in Education. And I can give you both of those websites uh, if you're interested. I May Call is a, a national group I, I have the privilege of currently serving as the chair of the Advocacy and Issues Committee for I May Call. So I've got 75 folks on my committee that represent state agencies, that represent uh, politicians, that represent everybody down to the district level. We meet on a monthly basis and we look at the policy issues in, in, across our nation as it relates to digital and blended learning. We did a survey last month and we asked our members, uh, do, are you familiar with what's going on in Georgia? And if you are, can you please tell us uh, what, are, what would be your top three recommendations if we needed to make policy change? The number one recommendation that came back was change from seat time to competency-based education. So exactly that verifies. Um, our survey verifies your findings as well. Eliminate geographic boundaries. Allow students from any area to enroll in any school and have choice. Uh, teacher certifications. Move to the, we are moving to the Common Core Standards. And so there should also be a national certification that goes along with that. 
currently in Georgia, there's 340 high schools, and there's 70 highly qualified NCLB, highly qualified physics teachers. That means that almost 75% of the students in Georgia do not have access to a highly qualified teacher at their school site. A way that, something that can solve that is digital learning. If we could have a Georgia qualified, high, highly qualified physics teacher actually doing online instruction and a blended digital model, we could open that up to all of the students in the state. But there are barriers that are currently uh, prohibiting that from happening. We could also open up uh, other teachers. <coughs> I, uh, prior to moving to Atlanta, I spent 25 years in the public education system uh, in California. So I worked uh, not only as a site administrative system superintendent, but worked at the Department of Ed there as a consultant. And uh, one of the things that we were able to do is we actually started an online uh, high school in the Los Angeles area for at-risk kids, kids who were, uh, who were at risk of dropping out. 70, over 70% 70 of our kids that enrolled in that school were already dropped out. We were amazed at the response. These are kids that wanted an option, but life got in the way. But because um, we were doing it online, I was able to hire, like my French teacher, was actually a professor at UCLA. So now these kids who were at a drop, at risk of dropping out in their traditional high schools at their site-based locations, now had access to learn from a professor at UCLA, all free of cost to them. We need to provide that to students everywhere. Get the high, highest quality instructors, to students without the barriers of geographic restrictions. I'm going to talk about the three elements that I thought we should call out really quickly about from the Digital Learning Now report. Um, the, the Roadmap to Reform actually published a report card for every state, and this was just issued. This is a report card for Georgia. It takes all these 10 elements and it rates it in 72 different uh, categories. Uh, so I can uh, show you how to get access to that as well. It's very interesting. But the one thing I want to encourage you with is that Georgia is actually one of the forefront runners in education. People uh, for the last several years have looked at all of the things that we've done right in this state and are looking at it as a model. We constantly look to Georgia and say, look what they're doing here, look what Georgia's doing here, look what Georgia's doing there. So I want to encourage you that on a statewide basis, you've, Georgia has done a lot of things well. Uh, the three things that I want to talk about briefly was um, element number nine was funding. So of course this drew the most uh, conversation in our in our meetings. Uh, how are we going to fund this? What does it mean if they're not site based, or can it be funded on a course by course basis? What if a student wants to go to school part time and take online part time? How do we fund that? What does that look like? And what are the funding levels uh, that that are at that are correct for online learning? So the recommendations of the committee was to create a self-sustaining funding system. So in other words, erase, erase the terms for funding. It should be year-round and it should be based upon students going in and out of school. So if you open up the school calendar and don't make it to a semester basis, when students get in, they matriculate, they move on when ready, then in six, eight weeks, they can graduate from that course and that provider will be paid for that course. One other note on the move on with Ready, um, three weeks ago I was working in Arizona and there's a high school, they've started, the uh, Center for Arizona's Future is actually on Arizona State University and it's an initiative led strongly by Senator Rich Crandall who's the head of the education committee in the state. They've implemented move on with Ready this year in several pilot sites across the state. So they have seen a lot of um, uh, success in that and I just mentioned that because if, when we move to do that here, other states are already a little bit ahead and we can learn uh, from them best practices. Follow, the funding follows the student and there is flexibility with textbook dollars. So the policy suggestions would be that the state law permits funding for instructional materials to be used to purchase digital content and systems. That's currently um, allowed. A state allows for digital content to be acquired through instructional materials budgets and does not discourage digital content with print adoption practices and the state funding model pays providers in installments and incentivizes completion and achievement. So that was a, that was a real controversial uh, point, but other states are seeing that they're paying not on seat time, but a portion when the student enrolls, a portion throughout the middle, and then a portion if they actually successfully complete the course. Uh, and the other, uh, the last recommendation is state does not limit the number of credits earned online. Currently, Georgia limits students to one course uh, per semester and allows for, a, uh, uh, allows for a choice. 
The second thing, both in our uh, in our elements and in our survey, was uh, there was a huge desire here to have a K-12 learning object repository. There's currently a bill uh, that's in uh, sponsored by uh, Representative Cassis and Senator Rogers, uh, HB 175. It's called the Online Clearinghouse Act, and it would actually create this initiative. So, according in talking to um, re, uh, to educators in the state, their thoughts was if we could if we can create this um, clearinghouse, we wouldn't have to recreate the wheel. So, let's um, have a clearinghouse where. Sorry, my slides are shared by all Georgia local school districts and is in a format that can be used with their learning management system. We need an interagency approach. University, state agencies, and school districts need to stop being in silos and work together to create this, aligned to the common course standards, and could develop protocols that would cover formatting, consistency of the environment, and standards for multimedia with an opportunity for national expansion. The next is uh, make high quality digital learning resources. Don't just give us PDF files of textbooks. Don't do what we've always done, but put it online. That is a big weakness right now of a lot of the programs. They, go, they, they just layer technology onto the instructional practices, but they don't redesign it for success. We need to push the envelope. We need to have more electronic gaming, 3D virtual world simulations and transmedia, and then offer differentiation of instruction assessment and accountability and infrastructure. So the last policy recommendation is the state law requires a majority of content such as textbooks to, to be provided digitally. State law requires all schools to have high-speed broadband internet access. State law requires all teachers to be provided with internet access devices. And the state law requires all students to have internet access devices. And the last one is to eliminate the seat time requirements, which we've already talked about. So um, I would encourage you, uh, this is a really great read if you're interested in how Georgia did in 72 different elements. It's found on the Foundation for Excellence Education website, um, and it's uh, very illuminated. As well, uh, I do have this that talks about the funding structures, the Fordham Institute, and other opportunities that we have in Georgia. So thank you so much for your time, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody afterwards. Thanks, Lisa. Now, I believe that report was prepared before our Supreme Court's ruling recently, which is not just about charter schools. And just as we have this great opportunity here in Georgia, we are a leader in the nation, the Supreme Court is preparing our Constitution to really sort of put the walls up around our, you know, these geographic boundaries and where we have an online uh, that now technically would have to go to every single district, 180 different school districts to be able to provide their courses to be approved rather than the state authorizing them. And uh, so this is critically important by this constitutional amendment that you're going to be hearing a lot about in the next few weeks. It's so important for us to change because it really has knocked us back. We, we're not a leader anymore if we don't change that. The funding would be decimated. Thank goodness the Governor Deal has put funding into the budget protect these schools, but he said this is not going to go on forever. So we have got to amend the Constitution. It's a critical task. Uh, I was with someone two nights ago, and she had had a child who suffered from severe autism. And the doctors did not think that this person, this child, would ever really be able to function on their own. And thanks to the tuition tax credit scholarship that was passed in 2008, uh, she was able to find a, a, this unique school in Roswell called Jacob's Ladder that was able to turn her son's life around. He now is entering college, and she never would have been able to afford that option uh, if not with the tuition tax credit scholarship. That's a law that was passed in 2008, and if you had to think of a, a program that was, you know, in the minds of legislators when they passed this, it would be the Gold Scholarship Program. It is a model program. Lisa Kelly is the president of that scholarship program. Last year they provided over 2,000 scholarships, uh, about almost $9 million of scholarships. The recipients' families, uh, their gross income was under $26,000 on average. But these are individuals who did not have that choice. You know, wealthy individuals, others, they can move into the good neighborhoods and go to private school, but you know, our middle income and, and lower income families don't have that choice. 
And as I like to say, you know, Dean and I would argue Georgia Tech is you know, the best school in the world. But if you don't like math, Georgia Tech's not a really fun place. <laughs> and so this is not about, I, I'm a proud graduate of Gilmer County High School. It's not about saying those schools are not right. Gilmer County was great for me. I was very well prepared for Georgia Tech. But not every school's right for each individual. It's about finding the best opportunities for them, and the, the Gold Scholarship is doing that. And uh, so please welcome Lisa Kelly to tell you more about that. Thanks, Kelly. It is exciting to be here. Thanks so much for including me with these distinguished speakers to talk about this topic. Listening to some of these statistics, the, the challenges seem almost overwhelming in Georgia, uh, as they are nationwide the graduation statistics, the problems with kids not getting through post-secondary education. Um, I'm here to talk about something that's incredibly good news in Georgia. Thanks to Kelly, other folks at the Georgia Public Policy Foundation and members of their board. Thanks to legislators in this room. There are some rock stars in this room that have done something in terms of getting this legislation passed that does give us parental choice in education in K-12 through education. I'm going to throw some numbers at you. I'll keep it brief. Also, want to tell you some lessons learned that should help us as we try to expand parental choice in education. It's working. It's making tremendous strides and tremendous improvements in our state, and there is tremendous demand for it. Um, so, as Kelly mentioned, thanks to the efforts of all these folks, all these education reformers, in 2008, the Georgia General Assembly passed House Bill 1133 the Georgia Education Expense Tax Credit Program, and it was signed into law by Governor Sonny Perdue. That tuition tax credit program provides tax credits to Georgia taxpayers who make contributions to student scholarship organizations called SSOs. That's what GOAL is, an SSO. The SSOs have to use those contributions to provide tuition grants to eligible students to attend accredited private K-12 schools. Eligible students are any child that's in kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, or first grade. Starting with grades second and above, the child has to be moving from a public school into the private school. Back to the components of the tax credit and how it works. For a married couple filing a joint return, you can get a credit of up to $2,500 for making an investment or a payment into an SSO of that amount. An individual taxpayer can get a credit of up to $1,000. Importantly, C corporations, businesses that file and pay their own income taxes, can get a credit of up to 75% of their Georgia income tax liability for the year by making that investment in a student scholarship organization. I do serve as president of the Georgia Gold Scholarship Program. Currently, there are 37 SSOs recognized by the Georgia Department of Education as eligible to receive these contributions and to provide these scholarship awards but some of the SSOs are much more active than others. Goal has received 33%, one-third of all dollars contributed statewide since this program um, became law in 2008, so we are the state's leading SSO. Most of our, or much of our, um, success is due to the vision, the guidance, and the leadership of our Goal Board of Directors. There are a couple of those individuals here today. Terry Hartman is with us, and the chairman of our board, Rick Gilbert, is with us. And we owe such a debt of gratitude to them for their leadership. Thanks. I'll briefly hit on the lessons that I think have been learned in just three and a half years as we've embarked on this parental choice program. The first one comes from just examining the raw data of our results in these, these years. It shows how incredibly popular this program has become so quickly with parents, of course, who are seeking ways to have access to schools that will be better, their children will be better suited for, will get them on a path to success. With private school communities who are embracing the opportunity to bring in students of diversity um, into their communities, and with Georgia taxpayers who have just gotten on the bandwagon in record numbers. Let me just sort of set the stage. Each year, the state sets aside $50 million of these tax credits. Since 2008, tens of thousands of Georgians have contributed more than $122 million under the program. Gold has received um, $40 million of those dollars. $10 million have come from corporate contributions. 200 corporations have made the investment, totaling $10 million in this program. 
$30 million has come from 15,600 individual taxpayer contributions. The amazing thing about this, those people are now school choice advocates. They are fired up about what this means. They realize they're giving a student an opportunity. They are on fire for this cause. It's something they might not have thought about um, two or three years ago. Now the scholarship side, and this is the reason for being for our organization, we have obligated $38 million of those funds raised for scholarships. About 4,000 students so far have been awarded a gold scholarship. More than 22 million in tuition grants have been spent to this point. Another 15.5 million has been earmarked for future year awards for those students as they continue through those private schools and for additional scholarships for other students in the future that come forward whose parents choose to send them to a qualified private school. With the rapid growth in the popularity of the program, for the first time in 2011, the entire 50 million of available tax credits was consumed. It was completely gone by the 1st of November. The, this is bittersweet because it's wonderful how popular this got, but more than Goal alone had to refund more than $2 million worth of checks to more than 1,000 taxpayers who were denied trying to um, get their share of the credits toward the end of the year. It makes sense. People like to do this toward the end of the year, a tax credit opportunity, but it's now a foot race to get to the $50 million and to get a share of it. So the popularity of this program and of the Goal program leads us to the second lesson. There's tremendous grassroots support for an increase in the cap on available education um, credits each year. Now our legislature did give us an amendment last spring that does increase the cap somewhat. It's now tied to basically a cost of living index, so we're between 2012 and 2018 each year it will be tied to the rate of inflation. What that means for 2012 is it will increase by about 3% to 51.5 million. That's something. But in contrast, for example, in Florida, they, in 2010, they raised their cap on their tuition tax credit program to $140 million, with an automatic escalator of 25% each time taxpayers consume all of the cap. In addition, there is a bill introduced in Florida legislature this year that would increase their cap to $250 million. The third lesson that educational choice advocates can take from the success of the GOLD program is the fact that most of our 115 participating schools all around the state have used this program purposely to expand the racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic diversity of their student populations. This reality is a profound rebuttal to those who oppose parental choice in education on the grounds that it will perpetuate alleged discrimination and elitism in private school communities. In fact, even though there is no limit or, or mandate on recipient income in the law, goal participating schools have overwhelmingly embraced the goal suggested guidelines on income and scholarship award amount. As Kelly mentioned, as a result, since the inception of our program, the average household income of scholarship recipients adjusted for family size is $25,285. The average scholarship award amount is $4,162. More than $5,000 less than the amount um, uh, provided for by law, allowed by law. In many cases, those school communities are investing some of their own financial aid to make this happen for the parents who are seeking admission to their school. The fourth lesson is that business leaders have decided that they can no longer rely only on the public schools to educate future generations of Georgians. The Georgia Goal Scholarship Program, its participating schools around the state, and organizations such as the Georgia Independent Schools Association are proving to be responsible stewards of investments by the business community to help children get on a path to success. <clears throat> the fifth lesson is that contrary to regrettable and unsupportable opinions of some opponents of educational freedom, parents are very capable of making informed decisions about what are the best options for the education of their children. Each week, our staff receives articulate and impassioned pleas for this type of scholarship assistance. Our participating schools receive even more. With that, um, in closing, I'd like to briefly share with you 
an expression of gratitude from one of these students who has received the gold scholarship. This statement is from a young man, man named Austin Mulligan. He's a high school sophomore attending Benedictine Military School, an all-boys Catholic school in Savannah. I was at a meeting at the school and I heard him stand up and make these remarks. The Gold Scholarship Program is more than just a scholarship. It is an opportunity given to me who may, be, who may come from a less fortunate family but has every potential to rise up and do better. I am one of those fortunate people who received the Gold Scholarship and I can tell you one thing for certain. I was the proudest person alive to know that I was given the opportunity, not based on how wealthy my family is, but on who, on who I am as a person. Benedictine is the best school I have ever attended, and this is my chance to show the world and myself what I can do. At this school, we are changing the world, and I wouldn't be a part of it but for the Goal Scholarship. By receiving Goal, I made a promise not only to the school but to myself and my family that I will be the best I can be and do the best of my ability. This is what real wealth really is. He got a standing ovation after he um, made those remarks, and suddenly many other people in the audience decided they wanted to grab a share of these tuition tax credits and make this type of, type of opportunity possible for more kids. So Georgia has created a new model for the delivery of K-12 education. Parents, school communities, taxpayers, and the business community working together to provide relief and hope for thousands of children toward an improved K-12 path for themselves. We've got a lot to be proud of, but we can't rest until all families seeking relief have an option. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. What I learned, lesson number six, is a good deal for taxpayers, because according to the, your new ALEC book, I was just looking where totals for people spending in Georgia is 11500 close to it. I think your average scholarship around $4,000. So that's great. great. Um, I'd like to ask our speakers to come on up. We're going to open up for questions. While they're coming up, I want to recognize that Senator Rogers was here, uh, Senator Miller, and uh, Representative Setzler. I apologize I miss anyone else in the legislature. They're great education champions. We appreciate all they do at the Capitol. <laughs> questions? We have several universities in Metro who are interested in teaching. They have departments of teaching. And I found that they know very little about the educational computer games we're talking. I, I was so glad to hear you all talk about computer games and how important they are. But I found that there's a great uh, lack of knowledge. Uh, all the kids know about computer games and education and what you can do educationally if you'll read what's going on in the rest of the United States in the world of educational computer games it's just fantastic what's going on but I find that very few people are interested now my question is what are we doing or what is the state doing or what are you doing to talk to the teaching schools about educational computer well, thank you. Okay. So, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, there is a group called Project Tomorrow, and they've just issued a report about this exact same issue. So, what they did is they, they surveyed school administrators, school teachers, pre emergent teachers, and students. And they asked them all the same questions about technology. What they discovered is that this, the teachers who've been in the classroom for more than seven years actually were a, you know, adverse to gaming and doing integrating all the digital technology. The emerging teachers, meaning those that were either in teacher preparation programs or in their first years of teaching, were very excited about it. And this is, they, again, they're the, those digital natives. And then the, the, the students, it, this is just what they did all the time. So. Uh, this project was, uh, the report was issued in Washington, D.C. It's brought a lot of attention to this, which has forced discussions um, with teacher preparation programs on how are you integrating blended and or digital instruction into the certification process for teachers. So there's a lot of work going on right now looking at that as part of um, becoming a certified teacher. So do you want to speak specifically to Georgia? 
Well, I think one of the things that uh, our new chancellor, I hope will be understands, is, is the importance of this. And I'm, I know one of his initiatives is to truly work with the uh, departments of education uh, chairs and within the university system to talk about this issue. So I, I don't have a specific answer. I want to tell you that I, the chancellor understands this, and I think the chancellor desires to have that change. And I, I think you'll see some results of his work. Uh, a couple of uh, points. Uh, all these are good ideas. <clears throat> I respect them. But here's uh, my concerns is how can you implement these ideas within the local school system uh, under the uh, guidance and control and the assessments of the No Child Left Behind uh, rules and regulations, number one. And number two is that aren't the school superintendents, the local school superintendents, aren't they the gatekeepers of all of this technology? And how do you, how do you work at a local level? So I'll take the first question, ESEA reauthorization. Um, currently, actually, I may call, and our committee has been very um, influential in providing language in the new No Child Left Behind recommendations that will allow for digital blended learning. Uh, so it will it will help to usher in this change at the federal level. So that is, that's, that language has actually been submitted, and we hope to see it within the new reauthorized um, product. The, the only thing I would add is that, uh, of course, Superintendent uh, Barge has issued uh, new measures also to uh, evaluate uh, the state, and, and I think one of our schools, and I think one of the things that uh, is going to be important is, is giving us that flexibility. But you're exactly right. The superintendents is the gatekeeper. The superintendents are the ones of local systems out there um, constitutionally have an autonomy that's uh, very important to understand. Um, but it is going to have to be system by system um, education. There's there's no quick fix. There's no silver bullet beyond that, in my opinion. Back in the back. What kind of things? All what we talked about so far is academics and the digital learning and all that. But what about the hands-on portion of it? Especially, and, and I'm thinking more about the non-academic stuff. I'll give you an example. Within the last two years, I guess the Wall Street Journal had an article about mechanical engineering and how enrollment in mechanical engineering programs has gone up since they started taking the students into the shop and letting them work with lathes and milling machines and make things with their hands and it became less of a just a strictly academic thing. And I've got a business partner that came from China's MIT. He's got a bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering and he's one of the least mechanically able people that I know. I mean, he'll call me up, his car doesn't work, I'm having to try and describe the engine to him now. On the left side, what's, what do you see over there? On the right side, what do you see? And so, how do you work that into, say, the digital learning, where students can get a real practical thing and learn what they like and don't like? Well, thank you. That's an excellent question, and that is one that everybody is asking, and that's the whole point of what we call blended learning. So blended learning in the simplest form is the integration of face-to-face -face instruction, project-based learning, Socratic learning, and digital integration. So helping the teachers to retool their classrooms for blended and our digital instruction uh, so they understand the tools, they understand how to use the data assessment systems that are available to them through the learning management system. But we really believe, uh, it's my personal belief, that probably that full-time virtual is great for some kids, but it's been my experience in working in this world for about 12 years now that it doesn't fit a lot of kids and that blended I believe that full-time traditional is, is, is at one end of the spectrum it's kind of like a bell curve and probably 80 to 85 percent of the kids could really benefit from a robust and uh, blended program so that we have to look at the different elements that we have to do to provide for that like teacher uh, training and support and robust data analytic systems, the integration within the classroom, and awareness. The schools don't know what they don't know. They know they need to do this, but they are so busy with the day-to-day -day operations, they don't know how to get to that next level. So we need, to, we need to provide that kind of support for them as well. But truly believe, um, one of my uh, strong feelings is that in the education reform movement, there's been, especially with the emergence of charter schools, 
there's been this thought that, well, let's just blow up the public education system and start all over. Um, but when you look at the heart of the teachers, when you look at the heart of the people in the system, there are some really great teachers. There's some really great programs out there. They shouldn't be blown up. They should be supported and redesigned so that our kids can have the best of all worlds. One more. Last one, out. So, Walter, I have to talk to you about being clear. So, um, so a question I have is talking about the concept of uh, an innovation ecosystem. Because to me, it's not the what, it's the how. How do we align incentives to allow school systems to adopt these new types of curriculum? Um, and it's all because what you're talking about it, is what they were referring to in the back. It's, it's also blended learning, yes. Digital learning is important. Project-based learning should be a part of that. Also the concept of bringing in um, the business community in a tight choreography with the schools. Because there's actually some, I don't know if you're probably familiar with this, there's actually a school district in, in Tennessee that's with the high schools are starting an academies approach where they're turning all of their high schools into little niche specialization schools and they're allowing their students to actually move around the system but that you let the schools be good at something doesn't matter what but at least one thing that they're good at so if you want to be engineering there's a, a school that's good for that and they partner with industry that comes in and the kids are actually getting real world experience it might be digital it might be uh, physical but how do we create that environment the ecosystem that will allow these types of initiatives to happen because until we align incentives, to me that's the biggest question that we all are going to be faced with. with this. I'm just curious what your what's happening at the policy level to help us with allowing these types of things to happen efficiently and effectively. So a couple of things come to mind immediately, and uh, you're right. Uh, one of the things, the first thing that comes to mind is an awareness piece. So if the business community, the business community spends a lot of money every year, billions of dollars nationally on remediation skills and workforce preparation. So tying into some of the funding that's coming down from the federal government on workforce preparation bills, you know, the, for instance, there was, there was a grant that was made by the Department of Agriculture, actually, that provided infrastructure support to kids living in rural communities. So did we know about that grant? Did we apply for that millions of dollars? That could be a possibility. So it's an it's awareness piece of, of understanding what's already out there. Bringing those together in the business uh, partners, in the Chamber of Commerce have business round, education roundtables. Folks can participate on that. Some of the most successful schools that I've seen in the United States who have been doing this actually get private foundation support. So local foundations in their communities that say, hey, we want to invest in our school and we're going to give you X amount of dollars to be blended in digital learning and do pilots. Um, so there's a lot of philanthropy support being uh, driven to this initiative right now. And then uh, regarding the funding, it, it goes back to what I talked about earlier. Um, high quality digital content, uh, allowing kids to be uh, perform and go on competency, not seat time, and allowing the funding to follow the child, allowing it to be backpacked down to a course level so that a, a parent can choose all of that and then uh, removing the local barriers for, um, uh, well, mostly that. <laughs> one, one last thing I would say on the whole performance issue is the uh, in post secondary, uh, both the technical college and university system is in the middle of relooking really its formula. And a portion of that formula in Complete College Georgia is a performance base. It's not, I mean, butter in the seat, if you will. So I think a very interesting model will be is. Our ability to basically fund education with a performance component going forward. Senator, you got one last question? No, I, I guess the point that the gentleman raised here, I think you need, you need to look at what we're doing in the state, too, from a standpoint of the whole emphasis about the last four or five years has gone to college and career ready. And that's not an either or. It's college and career ready. We've passed legislation, Bridge Bill, House Bill 186. We've got dual enrollment, so we've got kids that are going from the high schools to the technical colleges and the universities. We've got to pay both institutions to get them to do it. But this way we're getting kids to contact the act. The most valuable student in the next decade is going to be with the one with the academic background, which has some technical skills and technical courses. And that's the direction we're going in the state. It's not perfect, but if you look at, like, particularly last year, House Bill 186, 
there's a lot of things. The assessments that you talked about, Dean, starting in tenth, eleventh grade. You know, it's to get people ready for, for to be gainfully employed, to be productive citizens. We're out of the business of trying to produce Rhodes Scholars. It's to be productive citizens. So I think it ties in for everything we're talking here and the Education Funding Commission we're working on right now. I mean, your, your, your components are old, folks. We haven't looked at it in 26 years. There's no component for, for digital. Everything is, we fund textbooks, which are out of date within two years. So we're going to make a big transition to, to digital in the state, but we've also got to build out the broadband, which you were talking about, because we don't have that everywhere in Georgia. It's not DeKalb County. It's not Cobb County. you got these places in South Georgia. They don't even have cell phone service. So we have to be cognizant of that when we talk about these things, particularly in the metro area. We've got to make it work for the 1.7 million kids. That's, that's, thanks, John. Thank you, Senator, for the work you're doing. Thank you to our speakers for being here today. It's a great program. We're going to continue this conversation on February 22nd, uh, talking about all many of the things we talked about today. Got Representative Sethworth. Could I say something about this constitutional amendment? Sure. House politics and politics, just very briefly. I really don't want to take a lot of time on this, but um, the, the, the reference was made earlier to the vote for the constitutional amendment uh, that affects this whole school choice issue as a state. I want to just take a second to talk about the importance of it. Um, sadly, it really comes down to the issue of politics and power. Uh, we need to get a two-thirds vote in the House in the next four weeks to put this idea of choice on, on the ballot in, 2000, in November of 2012 to pass the constitutional amendment to settle the question, can the state create these kinds of choice structures? Without the state being able to do that, school boards, as, as, referred to, as was referred to earlier, have absolute power. Um, in fact, uh, Carol Hunstein, the Chief Justice who wrote the majority opinion, um, cited a word that's nowhere in our Constitution, in our Georgia Constitution, exclusive authority. And without the constitutional amendment, school boards will have exclusive authority. So things that have not even yet been challenged will, will be challenged in court, and many of the kinds of innovations we've seen in Georgia will be turned backwards. Um, I say that to say the kids in the state who can benefit from this the most are perhaps inside the metro area, inside the perimeter. But those are the representatives and senators who are most profoundly opposed to this. And I say that to say, it's, it's, I'm not going to make a partisan claim here, but it's what we need is we need every person in this room to find a legislator who lives inside the perimeter and represents an inside the perimeter district whose kids can most benefit from this, find them in the next two weeks and influence them to support this constitutional amendment. It is a person by person, vote by vote count. One pickup is a, is a big win for us. But we, we're right on the margin. Um, and we really need to tip some things. And I think the influencers in this room need to understand how desperate we are as a state. If we're going to do the kinds of things we talked about today, it's going to play out in the next three or four weeks in the vote of the House of Representatives. We've got to change people who are now, who've been for choice in the past, who will say they're for choice in town hall meetings, who will go to, 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 to HOA meetings, who will go to church gatherings and say they're for choice, but have committed to vote against this constitutional amendment, which we desperately need. So. Think about what you can do. Um, we've got about three or four weeks to get this vote, or it's, it's going to be two more years before we can back this. Thanks, Ed. Caveat, George Public Policy Foundation does not lobby. We're 501c3. But uh, having said that, yeah, this this is a turning point for Georgia. Yeah, I'm a native of Georgia. I'm the seventh generation. Do we want to be a leader? Or are we going to accept the mediocrity we've had for too long? It's an economic development question, but it's really a question about our kids and their opportunities. So thank you for coming. We'll see you on February 27th.